A lot of people use that to pay off some old bills, but uh, I think I want some other stuff this season. This is, this is my season for balling, y'all. Just joking, 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 joking. But we do have a word for you. I won't be before you too long. I promise that. We're coming from the book of Luke, if you had it, let us stand for the reading of God's word. Luke chapter 8. And we'll commence our reading in verse, verse 49 and conclude in verse 56. Luke 8, 49, 56, familiar passage. Pretty sure y'all heard the story already, but we're going to do the best we can to shine some new light. And hopefully that is relevant to your area of need today. And when, you're, when you get there, you'll find words similar to these. I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible, but it all says the same thing. It says, while he was still speaking, someone came from the house of the synagogue, official saying, your daughter has died. Do not trouble the teacher anymore. But when Jesus heard this, he answered him, Do not be afraid any longer. Only believe, and she will be made well. When he came to the house, he did not allow anyone to enter with him except Peter, John, and James, and the girl's father and mother. Now when they were all weeping and lamenting for her, he said, Stop weeping, for she has not died but is asleep. And they began laughing at him, knowing that she was dead. He, however, took her by the hand, called her, saying, Child, arise. And her spirit returned, and she got up immediately. And he gave orders for someone, for something to be given her to eat. Her parents were amazed, but Jesus instructed them to tell no one what had happened. And for a subject we will use this morning, there's hope in hopeless situations. You may be seated. There's hope in hopeless situations. There's, all, there's what they consider to be perhaps one of the greatest heavyweight fights of all time, and it was between a guy that is considered the greatest heavyweight in Muhammad Ali and his opponent, opponent, the hard-hitting George Foreman. George Foreman, uh, just to let someone know if you didn't know, grew up in the city of Houston, walking the main streets of Fifth Ward. Back then, they called it the Bloody Dipper. George Foreman was in a fight with what we call the greatest heavyweight, Muhammad Ali, in Africa. And man, George Foreman is also considered the hardest-hitting heavyweight to ever lace up a pair of gloves and step inside of a boxing ring. I mean, so he, so Muhammad Ali is in this fight with the, this hard-hitting heavyweight champion. So the bell rings, D, round one. George Foreman comes out swinging, landing body blows, head shots, shots to the face, shots to the body. And Muhammad Ali leans on the ropes. The same thing reoccurs in round two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. But we know round eight as the rope of dope. It is when after a while of leaning on the ropes, absorbing all of these punches that George Foreman threw at Muhammad Ali and landed, Muhammad Ali was able to spring off the rope and hit uh, George Foreman with multiple combinations which led to knocking out George Foreman. Right. And I don't know who I'm talking to in here today, but you all are in the fight of your life. It's a tough season in your life where you've been fighting, and even I don't care how much you've been swinging, trying to fight back, the enemy has been landing blows in succession. I'm talking about punch after punch, and after a while, those blows start landing. But can I encourage you to do what Muhammad Ali do, and that is lean on the ropes? And I'm not talking about the physical ropes that he leaned on, I'm talking about the spiritual ropes, and that is the Word of God. And when life has a way of handing uh, punishment towards you, when you begin to suffer, when you begin to hurt, when you begin to feel pain, lean on the Word of God. And I don't know who I'm talking to in this year, but you said at the end of 2014, I'm not dealing with the same things in 2015 that I dealt with in 2014. 
But you fall down and it's still early in the year, January, February, and March, you're dealing with some of the same things, if not worse, that you dealt with last year. Some of you all have already had to close the casket on the loved one. That is a hard blow. Some of you all have been working the same job and have not got that advancement that you think you deserve. That is a hard blow that you have to train people that just got the job last week, but you've been working on the job over 15 and 20 years. What a blow. You don't have no money in your pocket and your child walk up to you and say, Mama, Daddy, I need and you can't provide for that child. That is a hard blow. And I don't know what it is that you're dealing with, but life has a way of dealing hard blows to you. But what I encourage you to do today is lean on the word of God. Because I know that not only do the work, the roof offer support and stability, but these ropes also serve as a spring or as a bounce back. And I don't know who I'm talking to, but I believe somebody sitting in those chairs is getting ready to bounce back. Bounce back on the word of God that when the enemy throws some stuff again, to throw some word back at it. And it is the word of God that will help you fight your fight. It will help you win your battle. And the Bible teaches us that our fight is not against flesh and blood. My fight is not against you or against Pastor Howe. Your fight is not against me or your child. Your fight is not against your co-worker nor your church member. But it's against principalities and powers. It's against the things that you cannot see. So I suggest that if you can see it, you ought to stop fighting it but begin to pray. And ask that God will give you the strength and the ability to be able to handle whatever it is. And he says that you need to put on the whole arm of God so that you can stand against the wiles of the enemy. Because the enemy has a way of beating you up and I don't know who I'm talking to. But some of us have been beat up on for a long time. But it's time for you to get your victory back. And the reason I know that you can win is because God has already won the battle for you. All you have to do is lean on the ropes and trust in his provision. I believe today that Luke records this passage of scripture in chapter 8, talking about Jairus to encourage somebody in him that it does not matter what the situation may be. As long as God is in control, and God is still in control. As long as God is in control, there is hope for whatever it is that you're going through. Jairus is faced with a situation. His 12-year-old daughter is at the point of death. She is very sick. Jairus is a brother who has a whole lot of authority in the midst of people with authority. And Jairus found out what you and I already know. And that is, I don't care who you know or what you know, sometimes you'll be faced with a situation that can't nobody help you with but God. And I like that because Jairus had sense enough to go to a man that he knew had the ability to help him in this situation. So he go to Jesus, fall at the feet of Jesus and pray to him or beg him to help him in this time of need. And just like God does for us, he meets Jairus in his need and he's headed to the house where the little girl is laying. But while he's on the way to the house, there's another situation that rises. There's a woman that had this flow of blood for over 12 long years. Some people say that she was on her monthly or she was on her cycle. And I don't know what the situation is, but she had a situation where she had to go and see doctors. For all of these years, and, 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 and other areas said that she wasted all of her money in giving these doctors to tend to her need, and could nobody help her with the situation. But she heard that she saw that Jesus was passing through. And I don't know who I'm talking to in there this morning. I believe that the Spirit of the Living God is in this auditorium right now. And since He's here, you ought to reach out and grab hold to the Spirit because that is what's going to help you deal with what you're going through. So while he was going through, she reached through the crowd, she pressed through the crowd and just touched the hem of his garment and it says immediately her flow of blood ceased. Jesus said, somebody touched me. The disciples responded by, it's thousands of people around you, Lord. Everybody's touching you. But he said, Jesus 
Jesus says, nah, this ain't no regular touch. This ain't no everyday kind of touch. This is a special touch. He said that this, this is not I'm just showing up at church on a Sunday morning kind of touch. This is not I'm just going to sing in the choir because they need somebody to sing in the choir kind of touch. This person really needs me and they believe that I am the one that is able to meet that need kind of touch. And Jesus helped this woman in her, problem, in her, in her place. Now, I have a problem now, just like a lot of you all have a problem with some people. And that is that you really need God. But it seems like God is blessing everybody else but you. And I believe that God stopped and took that time to bless this woman because he knew that if he did that, that they should have strengthened Jairus' faith. And I don't know who I'm talking to in here right now. Don't get mad. Or don't be jealous when God blesses another individual. I find out that if God is blessing your neighbor, he's in your neighborhood. And your blessing is on the way. So instead of throwing stones at people when God blessed them with their house, when God blessed them with some new transportation, when God blessed them with their food, don't get mad because God is doing it for them. Celebrate them because God is getting ready to do it for you. God allowed your hours to witness that, to strengthen their faith. And that's why we come to church on a regular, is that we get to see what God is doing in somebody else's life. And if God has the authority and the ability to bless somebody else, God can do the same thing for you. But we see that there is hope in our hopeless situations. Somebody is dealing with death, finances, loneliness disobedient children. But whatever your situation may be, God sent me here this morning to let you know that no matter what the situation is, there is hope in this situation. So don't, don't, don't give up on your, your finances. Don't give up on your family. Don't give up on your children. Don't give up on your husband or your wife. Don't give up on that person because God can turn that thing around. How do I know? Because he's done it for me. And if God has done it for me, surely he can do the same thing for you. So I see three things here, and I bid you adieu and go home and enjoy this nasty weather all by myself. One of the first things I see that if you want that situation to be hopeful again, is that you need to know that everyone cannot perceive your potential. Everybody cannot see what God sees. Everybody don't believe what you believe concerning you. Everybody cannot perceive your potential. Verse 49, it says in chapter 8, while Jesus was still speaking, someone came from the house of the synagogue's official saying, your daughter has died. Problem, because Jesus is talking. The word of God is going forth, and somebody else is going to talk. That happens sometimes in church, as we see it today, that while the preacher is up preaching, for some reason y'all find everything else to do but listen to the Word of God. That when the Word of God is going forth, that's when you ought to cut off everything else. Tune your ears into what God is saying, because it might be a blessing to what God is saying at that opportune time. Stop talking, stop texting, stop tweeting, Stop Facebooking while the word of God is going forth because God is saying something concerning your life. But while Jesus was talking, somebody else began to talk. But the good news about it is that when they offer words of discouragement, God had a message of encouragement. Because in verse 50 it says that while they said that, but when Jesus heard it, he answered saying, do not be afraid any longer, only believe and she will be made whole. Jesus says, Jairus, I know that you just got fearful. You heard the bad news about your daughter. She has died. But stop being afraid. And God is saying to somebody in here, stop fearing. Don't operate in the spirit of fear. But operate in the spirit of hope, believing that God can do it again in your life. Because the word of God has to be true. God said in his word that before a little bit of his word, return unto to him for it. Heaven and earth shall pass away. And we are still here today simply because the word of God is still 
still true. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I like that it says that even though she is not well, she will be made well. And that took me to 1 John chapter 3, verse 2. It says, Beloved, now we are children of God. You know, if you have a relationship with God, you are God's child. Right. You're no longer just God's creation because the whole world is God's creation. But because of your relationship with him, you are now God's child. Now here's the benefit of being a child of God. It says, it has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when he appears, how many of y'all know that Jesus is coming back? That's right. And it says that when he appears, we, all of us that are children of God, will be just like him and we will see him for who he is. John is simply saying that you are not what you will become. You are not a finished product. I believe you ought to turn to your neighbor and say, I'm just under construction. I'm under construction. I'm not yet what I will appear to be. I know that you look at me and I go to church and you expect me to be this A1 Christian, but there are times when I yield to temptation and I make mistakes in my life. But the good news today is that even though you're making mistakes today, there will come a time in your life that you will be just like him. You've already been justified. You are being sanctified, but one day, all of us will be glorified. The Bible says that in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, we will meet him in, in, in the sky. I might belong to Galilee, you might belong to Second Advent, but we all belong to the same church. And that same church, when God part the sky, we will be just like him. So stop looking at me when I make mistakes in life, because I'm not yet what I will appear to be. But one day, I will be all that God Separate yourself from some people. 
you may need to separate yourself from some places and separate yourself from some things. I don't know what it is, but separate yourself from it so that you can move forward. Verse 51, it says, when he came to the house, he did not allow anyone to go in with him except Peter, James, and John, the girl's father and the mother. Look at who Jesus took in with him. He took in his, what many would consider his closest disciples. I don't believe that God showed favoritism, but I do believe that that son was a little in touch or in tune with him as others were. So he took in those that were closest to him and those that was close to the little girl. He took in the people that believed in the power of God and believed that there was still hope for their child. Jesus separated himself from the crowd that was following him because you do know just because there's a crowd will mean that everybody's in your corner. That's right. So don't get mad because there's only a few people in here and we don't have a membership that some of these other churches may have. Just because they have a whole lot of numbers don't mean that they have a whole lot of followers. You may not be a mega church, but you can be a major church because of your relationship with God. And it says that Jesus separated himself. Everybody could not go and do what Jesus was getting ready to do. It says that even while he was there, there was this group of people, they called them professional lamenters, that when death occurred, that they had a, I mean, they, they, they knew how to show up at the funeral and fall in the casket. They, they knew how to do it, and they cried to the point the way it got on our Lord's nerves. It says, stop weeping, for she has not died, but she is asleep. And these people did a 180 because they went from acting like they was concerned and crying to start laughing. And how do you be hurt so bad from crying and you're crying until you just start laughing? It's because they was fake. And, 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 and these fake people started laughing at Jesus because they checked up for us. She didn't have a pulse. They checked her heartbeat. They tried to resuscitate her and nothing worked. And they knew that she was dead. And when Jesus said that she was not dead, but she just resting, they thought that was funny. And everybody cannot participate in what God is getting ready to do in your life. And I just wish I had a few people that believed that God was getting ready to do something in that life and know that the reason that you're going through what you're going through is because God allows stones in your life to separate you from some people, some places, and some things. Y'all, I, I grew up in this area. This is where I'm from, right here, right here. I mean, I walk these streets. I mean, I, I just think that I shouldn't have done, but this is where I'm from. And I can remember just a couple of years ago, we had Hurricane Ike. And Hurricane Ike caused a lot of damage to the point that well, some churches couldn't even much hold church on a Sunday morning because they did not have electricity. And they told us to stay in the house and wait till our help come. Y'all, but I'm a, I'm a nosy brother. I don't, I don't I, you know, I, 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 I'm, I'm a fool for damage and destruction. So I just wanted to see what Ike caused. So I hopped in my building and I rode the streets and I ended up in the Gulf Gate area. And the Gulf Gate, they got all these palm trees lined up on the strip. And I don't know why they got palm trees. It's not like we from Miami, we in Houston, we don't grow palm trees. But, but, but what God showed me was that I looked on the ground and I saw all of these dead branches just lying all over the ground. But the palm tree was still standing. And what God told me is that he allowed a storm to knock off the dead branches that was hanging on the top. And I don't know who I'm talking to in here today, but the reason that you're dealing with what you're dealing with is because you know who your true friends are. When the storms of life come, people that are not really your friends have a way of separating themselves. And God just want to separate you from the folk that don't mean you no good. So don't get mad at the storm. Thank God for the storm because God got a way of showing himself in the midst of the storm. So everybody cannot, everybody cannot go where God is getting ready to take you. And I just want to let you know you're getting ready to go somewhere. So don't get mad when family members stop talking to you. Don't get mad when your co-workers want to move on the other side of the cube. Don't be mad when people don't want to be your friend. Thank God that God is separating you from some people that don't belong in your life at that season of your life. Not only do I see that everybody can perceive your potential, everybody don't see the God giving potential in your life. Everybody cannot participate in your progress. Everybody can't go where God is getting ready to take you. And finally, I see that everyone has potential for progress. 
Everybody in here has potential. It don't matter what they told you when you was growing up, you have potential. Y'all remember growing up, there were folk in my family that said, boy, you'll never be nothing. Because I know, I, I, I was a bad actor, I was a bad character. They said, you'll be dead by the time you're 21. 39, as a couple of weeks ago, and I'm still here. Uh, you're going to be just like your dad. God bless me with a son, and I'm nothing like my dad. Because I know what God said concerning my life. And you need to know what God says concerning you. Well, you're going to be more than what people say that you would be. It don't matter where you're from, what family you come out of, you have potential to be successful in this life. You don't have to be from many other lands. The woodlands, the sugarlands, the pearlands. But you can be a product of all the wars. First war, second war, third war, fourth war, no fifth war. It don't matter where you're from, but because of God in your life, you have potential for progress. Now, look at it. This girl was dead. I mean, no lie. But Jesus saw potential. People look at you and they see your situation. They know what you're going through. And they say, there's no more hope for you. Yeah. Instead of encouraging you, they start lamenting over you. That's right. Because they don't see life in you. They see death. And I just want to speak to some parent right now that's dealing with an unruly child. It may look like they'll never get it. But can I let you know that there was a time in your life that your parents may have looked at you and said that you will never get it. But look at you now. So don't forget where you come from because if God can change you as a person, God can change your child. And it don't matter what your child has done or is doing, there is still hope for your child. Somebody's in some marriage or some relationship and it looks like it's at a dead end. And you're ready to throw in the towel, wave the white flag or surrender, abandon ship, give up on the whole situation, but don't give up because there's somebody sitting next to you that was in the same situation and 30 years later they're still married and say, they'll testify and say, it wasn't easy. But we made it because we trusted in God. And I don't know who I'm talking to, but if you just trust God in your situation, you have potential. At the beginning of this text, Jairus was faced with a situation. He didn't go to people in the synagogues. He went to the one that organized the synagogue. You'll catch that on the way out there. He didn't go to the law keepers. He went to the law giver. Right. He went to the one that had all authority all right. over everything. Right. Jesus, uh, Jairus went and tried Jesus. But I notice here in verse 56, and this is where my problem is at, is because it says that he, her parents were amazed, but Jesus gave them instructions. He said that don't tell nobody what I did. Now, if you go back and read the other synoptic gospels, that means that there are three other gospels that are similar in their stories. And that is Matthew, Mark, and Luke. John is in the gospel category all by itself. But in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, those are synoptic gospels, which means that you'll pretty much see some of the same stories in those three gospels. So as I read Matthew, at the end of Matthew, it said that Jesus' fame spread abroad, which means that somebody told what happened. Now, the problem I had is that I told God, I said, well, God, you should have got on the parents because you specifically told them not to say a word, but because they talked, Jesus' fame was spread. And God said, nah, they didn't do nothing wrong. I said, they did do something wrong, God, because you told them not to say anything, but they said something. And God showed me, he says, that they didn't say a thing, that they kept God's word. And I said, well, how did Jesus' fame spread abroad? And he said, well, look who was in the room. And I said, I know, the mother and the father. He said, who else was in there? I said, okay, Peter, James, and John. Well, why didn't he rebuke Peter, James, and John for doing what he told them not to do? 
He says, because Peter, James, and John didn't say anything. I said, well, God, I'm running out of people because it's Peter, James, John, the father and the mother, and Jesus. Jesus is not going to say nothing. He's not going to go, he's not gonna go against his own word. And he says, keep on looking who's in the room. And that's when it hit me. That was a little girl who had been 12 years old, and she died, and God says, Tada. That's who opened up her mouth. And what God showed me is he said that the father tried Jesus, but the object of the miracle testified about Jesus. And I'm looking at the objects of so many miracles in this auditorium today. So what God told me to tell you is don't let nobody else beat you telling what God has done for you in your life. Should nobody else tell about the goodness of God in your life? And I just like to take a minute or two and share how good God has been to me with somebody. My mother passed when I was five years old, and they wanted to put me in a foster home because I didn't have a daddy they wanted to take me in. But God provided a grandmother, and she took me, my brother, and my sister, and my grandmother raised me up to where we didn't have to be separated and go into a foster home. Can I tell you what else God did for me? I found out two weeks ago that my mom and daddy, that they, they had me unexpected. That they didn't want to have a baby. They were just doing what they do, and all of a sudden a baby popped up. And, and, and they wanted to abort the baby. But my great uncle told me that I had some broke parents and they couldn't afford to have an abortion. And I told them, thank God for some broke parents. Because God had uh, something to do for me in my life. People told me that I would never amount to nothing. They said that I wouldn't be preaching long. They said that I couldn't talk right. They right. They said I wasn't living right and folk gave up on me. But I serve a God that did not give up on me, but instead he continued to develop me. And I said, oh, I'll have to tell somebody that if God was able to do it in my life, what do you think he's able to do in your life? And thank God today that if he don't do another thing, if God don't do one more thing, God has already done enough for me when he gave me his son, Jesus, because Jesus hung down that cross from the 6th to the ninth hour. I believe from the 6th to the 7th hour, he reached up with his right hand and grabbed hold to the hand of God. From the 7th to the 8th hour, he reached down with his left hand and grabbed hold to you and I. And from the 8th to the ninth hour, he brought creation and God back together again. And you do know that's why Jesus came, to make our fellowship right with God one more time. And I thank God that he died. Didn't he die? Mark said he died. Matthew said he died. Luke said he died. John said he died. Pastor Hall said he died. Reverend Williams telling you he died. Jesus died. But the story don't stop there. But early on the third day morning, Jesus got up. Not with some power, but he got up with all power. And I thank you today, God, that you didn't stay dead in that grave because the situation looked you have been dead for three days, and your disciples were beginning to lose hope. But on that third day morning, we saw that there was hope in a hopeless situation. And I don't know who I'm talking to right now, but God is speaking to your life right now to let somebody know, don't give up on your situation. If God done it once, he can do it again. But in the meantime, you ought to open up your mouth and tell a dying world about a risen Savior. And you ask me, how do I know that he lived? Because he lived in me today. When I think back over my life and begin to look things over, I can truly say that I've been blessed. I got a testimony. I know he's all right. I know God's been good. And if God has been good to you, you ought to stand to your feet and let somebody know by the lifting up your hands that you serve a real God. He's real, I tell you. He's real in your life. He's real in my life. And I told someone that I'll bless the Lord at all times. And his praises shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make a boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. And let us exalt his name together. And if you know God is getting ready to turn it around, you ought to let somebody know that it's not over until God says it's over. It's not over until God says it's over. I'm here to tell you that God can do it. He can do it if you just
just left. All hope is not lost. There's still hope. As hopeless as the situation may seem, as hopeless as it may be, as long as God is in, in, still in control, and we serve a God that has all power to handle whatever it is, give it to Jesus. I've tried him, and I know for myself. I don't have to tell nobody what God did for my grandmother. I can talk about what the Lord has done for me. I thank God for my grandmother. I, I, the, the reason I know God can do it, Pastor Home, is because I saw him do it for my grandmother. My grandmother has four children living of her own, taking care of her children. Took me, my brother, my sister in, and three more of my cousins on very limited income. There were times in my life to where she couldn't afford to give us chicken and pork chops, and all she could do was open up a can of beans, cut up some wieners, and serve us some bean wieners. But I look at my life right now, and, I, and, I say, and I'm not bragging, but I've made way more money than what my grandmother ever made. But I'm doing worse than what she was doing. Because a lot of times I trusted in myself. I trusted in my ability. And I got myself nowhere to what uh, I get, you know, I, I look at, I complain about, Lord, I want more clothes. Lord, I want a bigger house. Lord, I want a better car. Lord, I want this. Lord, I want that. But we pass up people on the regular, they don't have a pair of shoes. And they are so grateful over the little bit that they may have. But we complain over so much. Our children are not that bad. They gonna mess up. But it's our job as parents to be there, to strengthen them, to encourage them that all, not all hope is lost. There's still hope over your situation because God is in control. You won't always be doing what you're doing. You won't always have that sin issue that you have. We're always going to have sin issues. But we're going to grow and develop where we won't keep doing some of the same stuff that we've been doing. Because we serve a God that is patient with us. And I look at myself, if God has been that patient with me, Pastor Hall, shouldn't I be patient with you? If God can deliver me from some stuff, he can deliver you from it too. Father, we thank you right now for your word. Thank you for encouraging us today. And no matter how hopeless it may be, there's still hope. God, I believe that word was just for at least one person in today. One person in the midst of a bunch of eavesdroppers. God, but for whoever that one person may be, or two or three, God bless them today. Thank you that your word is going to change what, the way they view their life right now. And they'll begin to do things much better. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.